quorum. I'd like to call the August 25th, 2020 uh, CV Fiber Governing Board meeting to order. Um, I'm going to start the recording. Okay, it's recording. Uh, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Jeremy. Uh, yeah, a couple of quick ones. I was wondering if we could approve the August 11th uh, governing board meeting minutes. And then also, um, I noticed that you didn't have anything on there for round table. Oh, okay. All right, meeting minutes for August 11th and round table. <laughs> Could you tell me when, when did you send out the agenda? What's the date time stamp on that so I can find it, please? Uh, okay. August 23rd at 12.13 p.m. So it's a it's this basically the same agenda as we had at the last meeting. Any other items to add or anything to change on the agenda, Michael? Yeah, um, the um, the ad hoc group that that's reviewing the submissions to the Department of Public Service um, to, to recommend um, approving or disapproving um, projects. Um, it, an interesting theme has arisen about our general philosophy of whether we, whether our goal is to further the service as quickly as possible in this pandemic time, or whether we are looking to protect our business case so that we can be successful. And those are both really good points of view. And I wonder if the board ought to discuss that a little bit to give I, our group a little guidance. I think I think we'll have the time for that. So let's add that. Um, let's add that towards the end because I think that may uh, meander a little bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> just, just definitely just a, should be last. <laughs> all right. Uh, anything? Anything else? Any ad other additions or changes? Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, is there any public comment, any commentary on anything that is not on the agenda? Okay, hearing none, moving on. Let's do the let's do the August 11th uh, meeting minutes. Uh, does anybody have any comments or thoughts about those? I think those came out. Um, those came out. Those what the I, day afterwards, right? They came out pretty quick. There was a revised version that I sent around by PDF on August 28th. Uh, August 21st, I'm sorry. Okay. And those had a couple of minor corrections that people had pointed out to me. Okay, well, I move that we approve the August 11th, 2020 meeting minutes uh, as presented in the most recent update. Second. Okay, that's a second by Siobhan. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll just do this more quickly. Um, we'll just do all in favor. Aye. 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 Okay. Does anybody opposed or would like to make that a roll call? Please let me know. Okay, the ayes have it. Um, moving on to the subcontractor policy. Um, Alan brought to my attention that we actually have a policy committee. I'm going to move that we table this until the policy committee has a chance to work with this, um, maybe working from the draft that I sent out and the draft that um, uh, Ray sent out. Thanks for that, Ray. Um, and come back to us by the next meeting. Who? So I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, but can I get a second for that? Second. Second. I heard okay. Ray first, I think. Yep. Yeah. All right. So that was Ray's second. Um, the other discussion that I would have here is I don't know who's on the policy committee. I think uh, Alan is. Who else is? Ray? Siobhan? Anybody else that would like to be on the policy committee? Phil, Phil is on it. He's the chair. Phil, okay. I saw John Morris's hand go up. Maybe by accident. S say that again, Ray. I saw John Morris's hand go up. Was that an accident, or do you want to be on the policy committee? I would like to be on the committee. 
Okay, so we will will formally appoint you after this. That would give us five. I think we I think we've lost via attrition other members of the policy committee. Um, okay, not hearing anything else. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Anybody want to roll call on that? So this was a motion to add John Morris. Nope, no. Nope. This is a motion to to table the subcontractor okay. policy until it can be vetted by the policy committee. Okay. Sorry, I got a little bit behind up my notes. <laughs> All good. But while you're writing that down, I move that we appoint John Morris to the policy committee. Second. Second. Okay. I heard Phil on that second. First, the second first. Uh, any further discussion, Ray? I'm not sure I was officially appointed, so maybe just do a reconstitution of all the five folks who indicated they were interested. That's a that's a terrific idea. So we will reappoint uh, John Morris, Alan Gilbert, Ray Pelletier, uh, uh, Siobhan Pericone, and Phil Hayek to the policy committee. I will just, uh, if you're okay with that uh, friendly amendment, Phil, we will just stick with that motion. Yes. Yep. Good. So that okay. was John Morris, Ray Pelletier, Siobhan Paracone, Phil Hayek, and who is the last one again? Alan Gilbert. Alan Gilbert. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else on this? Easy peasy. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> Opposed? Anybody want to roll call? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Uh, moving along, uh, grant and funding update. So um, this is a um, so some good news. I have the the completed executed um, CARES funding. I don't even remember what it's called now. It's some sort of long acronym. The hundred thousand dollar grant. The hundred thousand dollar grant has been executed. It's been signed by the commissioner. Um, we're waiting to, at this point, we're waiting to get a check. Um, I followed up immediately after we they executed that contract, and I said, hey, remember that other grant that we have, the second half of the broadband innovation grant? And they said, oh, yeah, we've been busy. I was like, well, okay, great, but uh, we have you know people to pay. So they, um, they're going to track that down, hopefully, and give us an update, give me an update tomorrow. Um, I checked my mailbox just before this meeting, just in the event that it snuck in there, you know, while I wasn't looking. But uh, so, hopefully soon. So we'll have the we should have the second half of that, uh, the broadband innovation grant plus the, the hundred thousand for uh, the larger CUT grant. Um, any other updates on grants or funding that we should talk about? Yeah, David. Did we get the check from the Vermont Community Fund for ten thousand dollars? That we got quite some time ago. Yeah. Yes, and, and that was to, I deposited that the, the same day. And that the balance that we talked about when we were working out what we could pay and what we couldn't last week took that ten thousand dollars into account. And have we already talked about Northern Borders, um, or is that something that we should discuss? Well, we, we mentioned it. We mentioned it last week that we didn't get it. Okay. And and that the department didn't get theirs, which was going to be going to um, it was going to be going potentially to the CUDs for support. Um, and I, I actually looked at the list of places that actually got the grants, and I and I think I remember Ken saying something about a lot of it had to do with the match. But I I saw f the town of Fletcher got a rather large pot of money for extending internet up there. It's like 450,000 or something. And it wasn't even to as many people as we were talking about. So, I mean, that's uh, obviously it's the decision of the folks who are you know, uh, working out the points and such. Um, but um, so as you hopefully recall from last week also, there is a um, $2, million, <clears throat> uh, $2 million amount allocated by the governor uh, in his kind of current budget and there is actually hold on there's a meeting of senate finance on friday um which are which is likely going to discuss this mm -hmm. um and this is and again this is the opportunity um a lot of us are in washington county 
uh, Ann Cummings is the chair of Senate Finance. It would be it would be worthwhile if you know her or you're comfortable contacting her to um, let her know what you think. <clears throat> and your your House reps too. It would not be a terrible idea to let them know that we could really really leverage um, some of that money in order to do the build out much much more quickly. So what was that two million dollar funding? That was a that was an item that was included in the governor's budget. So they kind of passed a partial budget back when the legislature was in session. But because they didn't know how the the pandemic would work, um, they're coming back. Um, well, they were, I guess they were back today. The legislature's back today for a couple of weeks to approve essentially the rest of the budget and to look at you know what to do with the rest of the the CARES funding. So. There's $2 million specifically earmarked in the governor's budget for funding communications union districts. It's not, it's not ambiguous. It's not going to any other ISPs. It's going to communications union districts. David? Yeah, last week's um, House Senate Information Technology Committee meeting, there was some distress on the part of the committee that the governor was not allocating any of the remaining CARES money to CUDs. I don't think much is going to happen from that, but I just want to let everybody know that the legislature seems to be more in our court than the administration. But keep in mind, CARES funding has to be spent by December 31st, so it's it's better to get it from the governor's uh, FY21 budget. Yeah, we certainly have a lot more flexibility Hi. with that. Hi, this is Alan. Can people hear me now? Yep, I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, good. No, I have nothing to say. I, I just, I lost the internet connection completely, so I'm on the phone right now. Okay. Right, no, thanks. I just wanted, I asked that question because I was unable to attend the last meeting, and um, I just wondered if, based on kind of their response, there was a discussion about us accelerating, us making decisions about what the organization is going to look like and what it's going to own and all that, um, since it seemed that part of the reason why we didn't get it was um, related to the fact that we are still not mature enough in their eyes or whatever. Um, so. I was just wondering if that was part of the topic of discussion as to, you know, make kind of trying to formalize our organizational structure as soon as possible. So, so we have had a little bit of that conversation. I think we need to continue having that. I think one of the things that happened though, and it was a bit of a, um, a bit of a, a whiplash, for, you know, 24, 48 hours, we found out that we didn't get the Northern borders money. And then we found out that th this other funding may be on, on the table may be available. So I would say, I don't know that we need to change our tack too much um, unless we find out that the, the governor's you know, $2 million earmark or what have you um, is not available. If that's the case, then yes, then we need to change. We probably need to change our approach somewhat or at least re rethink what our you know, immediate six month, one year goal is. Well, either way, I mean, it would be it would be um, useful to um, try to, you know, even if we just did a comparison of the options, you know, and and went through and said, you know, with this kind of ownership model, you know, we could we'd have these benefits and these drawbacks, and kind of go through a, a rational process, hopefully leading some to some decision process. We, because even writing any kind of new grant without um, giving the business details, it's going to be uh, an impediment, possibly. Anyhow, that's all I have to say about that. So we, so we, we have had this conversation in, in various different permutations. And as far as I know, we, we have settled on, on an approach. And uh, Jerry Diamantidis said, sent out um, I don't remember when you sent it out, Jerry, but uh, kind of a, a decision looking at the, the lease versus own model about working, particularly about working with Washington Electric Co-op and their, um, 
and whether they're going to run the fiber or not, but particularly about the fiber project. Less about the wireless project, because I think we, you know, if we get the funding, we have a reasonably, it's a, I don't want to say straightforward, but we have a reasonably good understanding about how that's going to look in the short term. Um, so, um, but yeah, so I, I'm seeing David posting in the chat that as part of the application to Northern Borders, we didn't have the business plan done. So we weren't able to just hand them to hand them that. Um, but yeah, there have been some decisions made. And if I'm, if, if there are some specific decisions that you think um, that you think need to be made, Henry or anybody else for that matter, I would say, please, um, let's please, let's put it out there and make sure we get it on the next agenda, at least have a chance to, to talk about it. I'm just trying to catch up. I, I, I I'm, um, you know, that's all. Okay. Okay. Uh, anything else that we should talk about regarding uh, grants or funding? Jeremy. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I had to turn everybody's uh, cameras off because my connection's too slow. But uh, oh, oh, my hand was up. I'm sorry. No, okay. Ahead, so, um. I may be mistaken, but I think the Fletcher project was a construction grant as opposed to a matching grant for a loan. And I think that was that's more appealing to NBRC in general. It, it, David, is that correct? Or I was just okay. And, and the, so I'm just making that aside. And, and one other comment about um, the Senate Finance Committee hearing on Thursday and on Friday, there are going to be public hearings on the governor's budget, and um, that we all can participate in that. We have to sign up in advance to be able to speak, or you can just watch just like a committee hearing. So there's um, three different hearings on Thursday and Friday. Nope. They're all bear on the two million. I'm on call. Sorry, kiddo, you can't have the internet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anything else about grants or funding? All right. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you briefly, Jeremy, because you have a lot of uh, noise coming in from your side. Okay. David. Yeah. Is you heard any more from? Uh... The Vermont Community Fund on the two hundred fifty thousand dollars they were talking about a month ago. I have not heard anything one way or the other. Has anybody else heard anything? Okay, I'm going to go with no. Um, um, do you? Uh, can you refresh my memory? I don't remember too much about that, David. What was the plan with that? Uh, Rob, Rob Fish told us, the told at the Vicuda meeting, that um, the Vermont Community Fund was seriously thinking of just giving another two hundred fifty thousand dollars to the department to distribute for advancement of CUDs, and uh, I haven't heard anything back from that. But I assume the questionnaire that Rob mentioned this week that somebody has to fill out. I assume it's you, Jeremy. Yeah. has to do with that. I, I think that questionnaire will probably support that money. Sounds good. I will, yeah. So ho hopefully I'll have something to report back at the at the next meeting. Okay, so let, let's move on um, to appointment of an executive director. Um, it seems like we weren't able to get a good recording of the um, of the one interview, um, if we're, but again we should probably go into executive session to discuss this. Um, let's see. Um, hmm. The the philosophy about the um, us doing the approvals of the projects would normally come at the end of this, but I don't really want to uh, kind of kick Orca off and then ask them to come back. Um, and we have some other other folks attending who are not on the on the board. Um, let's let's move up the discussion about the philosophy about approving projects or not. Um, do you want to uh, re-summarize re what you were saying, Michael? Uh, sure. Um, there's there's a competition between two really good ideas. One is that 
there's a crying need for internet, as we all know, and um, the COVID money is out there to that need and to um, build at least 25 megs, if not much more, to a lot of locations. And so it's easy to make the argument that those people who would benefit from these projects should not be denied. And then the countervailing argument is that we're proposing a business that needs to at least break even in a certain number of years in order for us to get continued funding. And if we um, approve or not disapprove um, proposed projects that might jeopardize that business case, um, we're um, we're create we're creating a, a conflict for ourselves, and so they're both good arguments. They both make sense, and um, it's it's tough for those of us who are in the ad hoc group trying to make those decisions, and and we are having that discussion. So I thought it might be useful if we got. Um, aired it out a little more at the board. Um, I didn't ask anyone else before I said it, so um, there it is. So that's that's the issue, and I'm curious what other people think. All right, Jeremy, I see you have your hand up, and uh, you are kind of the, the lead on our responses to these uh, CARES money projects, so take it away. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and Jerry also noted in the chat that he would like to clarify his position because I'm kind of on one side and he's a little bit on the other. Um, Jerry, did you want to go first? Because that's the order that Michael, you, you, you go first because you had it um, in first in the chat. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeremy. That, 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 that's fine. Yeah. I, I just, I just wanted to, uh, to clarify that we're, we are, as, a, as an entity, as a municipal entity, trying to provide the highest quality, most reliable internet service to those that are underserved, and which, you know, half of us can't even be on the screen for that reason, right? We're in the middle of an emergency where these proposals are bringing folks from really, really bad internet to at least something, some of them even to fiber to the premises within the next 16 weeks. And my sense is that we aren't going to be able to bring internet to these folks for 16 months, if not longer. And if it makes a, a bump in our business plan, well, then it makes a bump in our business plan, but, you know, our business plan isn't a profit maximizing plan. It's a service maximizing plan because we're a municipal entity. So I think that that's the perspective uh, we should be, we should be taking. And, and, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Jerry. Back to you, Jeremy. So I, very much agree with what Jerry said that, you know, our goal is to get people served. My concern is that these for profit companies have shown that they're not really interested in expanding unless someone gives them free money to do it. And if they make it harder to fulfill our mission of getting everyone service, then we're kind of, you know, a few people are getting immediate benefit, but it's going to make it a lot harder for us, or it might make it a lot harder for us to get to everyone in the long term. So, you know, if we go out of business or if we're not able to get to people, then those people are maybe never going to get served or won't get served for many, many more years or you know, until Starlink comes through, if that even ends up working. I, I don't know what this what the right answer is, but that's kind of my concern. I've, I've been living at my house in Plainfield for over 10 years now. And 
Consolidated has done a little bit of expanding, but my internet is still crap here. Charter has done absolutely nothing. It, you know, if they expand where they're saying they would like to, I think it might cause a problem for one of our routes. And I don't know. I, I don't think that they're going to expand any more in that area. And I think it's just going to make it harder for us to get to some of those people that are on the fringes and that um and that charter is just they're just not going to do it they're for profit and they're they're always going to be people at the edges that they say like yeah they're too hard to get we're going to leave them whereas you know we'll we'll get there eventually you know even if it's with with a wireless tower to someone who's way way off the grid um i don't know that's my point of view anyways uh ray i saw a couple comments would you like to verbalize those yeah, so um, our, our raison d'etre is to serve the people on the fringes um, that we, I think that's our obligation um, with regard to whether or not, or, or whether this might impact our, our revenue streams downstream uh, is something that we can adjust downstream where all of us are competing right now for grant money and we should suck up as much grant money as we can possibly get to do the CapEx. Um, and that's what these internet service providers are also trying to do. But reaching these people on the fringe, including people in Plainfield and elsewhere, is why we're here. Okay. Uh, John Morris, did you want to verbalize what you had in the, the chat there? Sorry, it takes me a long time to get unmuted. Um, no, I don't think I need to expand on it. Uh, I just, my my feeling is, I guess I'm feeling uh, similarly to Jeremy that uh, doing the doing the, the short-term fixes seems like a nice idea, but it shouldn't it shouldn't get in the way of of the permanent solution. Thanks, John. Uh, Siobhan? So I guess that's that's my question, and I don't know if this is even answerable. But if, like Comcast expands into one of these areas, does that mean we would not be able to continue if they stop? Do we know what that impact might be, or are we is this all just speculation at this point? We don't know what would happen. I can I can probably answer that to a certain extent. I mean, really, what we're talking about is we're talking about a change in the take rate. Our, the model that we have that we've built assumes a certain take rate for people who have DSL or are otherwise underserved, and people who have cable. So the numbers that we've been working working with for underserved folks is that we we would have a roughly 40% of addresses that we pass taking service. So the take rate for DSL typically is 40%, and those are EC fiber numbers. So whether they're correct here or not, I, I don't know. When you get to cabled areas, the, the rate gets down to somewhere around 15%, give or take. Um, so it's just because for a lot of people, cable is it's good enough. And a lot of the assumptions that we make, and you can go back into the spreadsheet, you can go back into the spreadsheet and change those assumptions. You can turn, you know, and, change the size of the project and change how much of the project is cable versus DSL and see how that affects um, the, the bottom line. Not that we have a bottom line in the for-profit sense, but in the sense of how quickly we can get to, um, you know, and it's, again, it's not cash flow, you know, cash flow positive, but it's the, you know, the equivalent given that we're not seeking profit. Um, so do we, in the short term, Again, do we support these projects to get people decent service when it's reasonably likely that they will not support the greater effort when we get there? Uh, and Henry, I saw you had your hand up. Right, I think that was a, a really good point to make and it's kind of where I was going. I, I would have phrased it a little bit differently. Uh, what's happening right now is that the state is giving the opportunity to the existing ISPs to cherry pick um, 
their uh, build outs to get the most for their dollar. And um, so that's something that we kind of need to build into our model. Um, but on the other hand, I'm wondering what is the public service department really, you know, they've wrapped, they rolled us into this process process so that we can comment. What, what would be comments where they would deny them that build out, you know? Why did they include us and what can we say that would prevent someone from building out and what would we want to say to prevent someone from building out? Um, or do we just roll this into the model and, and, and becomes, uh, you know, less uh, reduced take rates or, or um, adoption, yeah. And, and I, I think to a certain extent, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be, you know, us kind of in a, with a, in a Boolean sense, you know, saying yes, no. Um, we can give context and we can explain what we're thinking. It doesn't have to be, you know, strict, strict strong support or strict, strong opposition. But I think um, if you don't mind, Ken, I'm going to pitch this over the fence to you. If you want to talk about what you have in the chat there, um, I think that makes sense. Yeah, so the department has a half million dollars um, for emergency planning, which means that the product needs to be accomplished by December. And I think this topic is huge, not just for CV fiber, but for a lot of the parts of the state. Um, and in part, it's related to some of the fixed wireless investments that they agreed to in the first round. Um, those also will make it harder for some of the CUDs to, to get started. So, and, and a and a, another part of this is there is a recognition that our work is going to be subsidized. And so if we can formalize the discussion over the next few months to recognize in any case where the state provides resources to an existing ISP that makes it harder for CUDs to do the, the comprehensive work, then, that, then the philosophy has to be, then that subsidy is going to have to be greater for those CUDs. So you know, if, if we can influence kind of this short-term planning to really reinforce that point, then yeah, our model isn't just going to be a model where we look at our cash flow. It's going to always be a model where we identify the necessary subsidy to accomplish what we're supposed to do, which is to get connectivity for everybody. Um, but I say that it's not obvious that that's what the half million dollars is going to be used for, but I hope that maybe the CUDs can pull together and say, because it's supposed to be emergency planning, so let's help us. They're spending $12 million on emergency investments. How does that affect the CUDs moving forward? I think would be a great topic, and I would love us to really encourage the department to go that way. I think we know, I think I know who's going to get the grant, and it's someone who understands the Vermont situation the grant to do the planning. I think they they welcome this topic to tackle. So so my my question for you, Ken, about this is that so, so what you're suggesting, if I can maybe paraphrase if I'm misunderstanding it, um, I'd like to know. So you're essentially saying we'd like to make sure that they boost the state boosts subsidies for CUDs who are going to be building in previously subsidized areas. Right, yes. And you know, are, again, June, June said, and I'll hold her to this, she holds that the CUDs are going to be the carrier of last resort. And that it means that, that we have a public, um, um, not responsibility, but a public mission that has to be supported. So in our responses to the Department of Public Service, we should emphasize that we're, you know, suggesting they go ahead with the build outs or whatever, assuming that, you know, this would reduce our take rate and that we would get compensation down the line to help achieve a break even point or something to that regard. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that's where we are. So, so maybe if we could just in, make sure we include a footnote and say, and say explicitly, you know, while we don't oppose these projects, there's certainly been discussion about these that will that will impact our take rate when we get there. 
that you know these specific locations are locations that we are you know thinking about in the you know short to medium term and that you know we we may need help covering these areas eventually jeremy so i mean to paraphrase kind of what it sounds like because there there are other projects sort of beyond the one that is contentious um the, the the one that's kind of contentious is a charter one but there are other ones i mean so is is this the board i mean if this goes to vote and all the rest are we deciding that we're basically not going to object to anything and maybe just respond to the public service department with a single note saying that we don't oppose projects in our area but we would like consideration for you know funding down the road is is that what i'm hearing or well i mean I, I, then... I i i think it's i mean we're essentially we're saying no in a kind of softer way right, right. we're saying if you fund this it's going to cost more in the long run so if it's their decision that they want to fund it in the short run they're going to have to come around later and if we're going to serve these people it's going to be more expensive i mean it's that's kind of unavoidable can we get michael and then henry thank you um so a couple of comments. One, um, the reason the department is following this procedure with us is the legislature instructed them to do it. And the reason the legislature instructed them to do it is the legislature clearly wanted to protect CUDs. They, the legislators really want to get service out to as many people as possible. And yet they don't want us to be sabotaged. And so there is, Certainly that argument. Um, if we look at the the study that Interal produced for us, you'll see that breaking even after three years, which is the goal, is really on the in the balance. It's really close whether we do or we don't break even. And if we don't break even, we're not fulfilling the Department of Public Services mandate, and we're gonna have a hard time going to the bond market later and asking and floating bonds because we're losing money and so those factors all matter um i i personally am in favor of of, of splitting it um looking for the egregious ones and saying no and looking for the good ones and saying yes and the marginal ones we can tell the department well we're not so sure you make the call but I like this new idea that Ken um, floated that perhaps down the road, they will subsidize us if, if they've subsidized someone else, but we don't know that's gonna happen. So, you know, it, it, that's a risk. So that's why I would say we should do both. There, there are certain, like the, I'll give you an example. There is uh, a proposal to do fiber to the home in two whole towns and, in two, in two CUDs, neighboring CUDs. One of them is us. And that project will cost several million dollars. Now, there's only $4 million available in each tranche of, of, of the awards. And so if that, even though that's laudable, it's wonderful fiber to the home. I mean, that's what our goal is. Um, if that happens and then a bunch of other projects we want funded, don't get funded because the money got used up, that's an issue too. So I think it has to be nuanced, um, but I think it was really helpful to get a little more feedback. And uh, I don't mean to close it down either, but um, my position is that we should be mindful of both objectives and try to meet them as much as we can. <laughs> okay. okay, Henry? Yeah, no, I just to follow on with the, the direction we were going, um, this is ideally, um, but ideally, we would get a thing that says, you know, um, Comcast that wants to build out in CV fiber territory in this area, and we would then go into our GIS um, analytics and say, okay, well, if they do that, um, that would have a bottom line effect of you know reducing monthly in, uh, income to 
for those people that get served and therefore the annual impact would be blah, blah, blah. I mean, all I'm saying is that if we have the ability, we could quantify the impact that each of these proposals that get passed our way would have on us um, in terms of, of, you know, the potential income that we wouldn't get because they were being adequately served. Um, so uh, before I get to you, Ray, uh, Andy, you had a comment in the chat that I, if I would like to hear from you if you could, and then we can have Ray after that. Yeah, sure. I think this, I mean, I, this has all been great. Um, and, and it's a tough question, but I, I think one of the things we also got to keep in mind is that even with, you know, short of massive capital injection, we're, this is just going to take a long, long time. So you have to also keep that in consideration. It's just been, a, you know, Jeremy was given the example of it's been forever with in Plinko, but it's going to be another eight years before you get fiber, even in the best of scenarios with us for funding. So, I mean, you have to look at it that from that perspective. So not taking advantage of these short-term improvements and in, in this funding material to at least improve its service as much as we can you just have to do it and we're going to have to take the hit on what it means to be, you know, whatever it is we are over the long run. Um, so if I can push back on, on you, Andy, real quick, just the, the question that I have, though, is that given that there's a limited amount of funding, though, that we get kind of a sense of which ones of these are going to be more expensive than others, how should, I mean, should we be weighing in on that, that decision? Should we be putting our thumb on that particular scale to, to you know, to get to, to get the solutions out there that are going to be a bit better and are are going to be less. Oh, certainly, yeah, to us. yeah. Okay. Well, but those that's not those aren't necessarily synchronized. Less damaging to us and better solutions, because <laughs> the better solution, the well, worse our take rate is going to be if we try to come up with it. But you are right. Like, I mean, getting there are some things. Obviously, if it improves the backbone, if it improves, you know. The, lowers the cost ultimately to then pull fiber to the premise. Those types of things are very favorable. Yeah, those are really good considerations. Yeah, but, yeah. but I mean, but, that but, requires some nuance. But then do we go by the kind of the utilitarian measure who's, you know, how many people are going to be served? Or, I mean, I mean, just any thoughts about these? I mean, these are, there's a lot of different ways that we can measure goodness, right? Sure, right. I just, I guess ultimately it's just, Keeping some of the time, the temporal aspects of this in mind, because you can't, it, it's really hard for me to, for us to oppose a project that, because we just have such an endemic problem. And in the end, it's a funding issue. It's, I mean, it's great the legislature created CEDs, but they didn't fund them, you know? And so now you've got a 30 to $50 million capital project with, without funding that's somehow going to magically rely on three years of EBITDA positive and municipal bond market build out. It's going to take 10 years. Everybody has said that to us. So you have to you have to balance that, to me. Fair enough. Uh, Ray, Jeremy, then David. So uh, what do we know? What we know is that the ISPs are going to be taking the low hanging fruit, that is an extension of their their existing lines, uh, in a higher density area than the people who have the higher misery index. And perhaps the state shouldn't underwrite the entire cost of that line. Perhaps the state should be limited to like one third. Since they're going to get a return on their investment sooner, yes, it's not worth their investment right now to do the whole thing. It's a big capital outlay for five additional miles, perhaps. But um, perhaps we shouldn't, perhaps the state shouldn't fund all of that. They, they could underwrite and grant, let's say, one third of that. Meanwhile, the rest of that fund goes to where the misery is, and which, which is our responsibility to, to address. So I think I'd be in favor of, of a little different formula here. Um, they're a for-profit entity. We're looking to recover, recover our operational expenses and our in our in a capital account to, to you know to replenish whatever's damaged. Um, they're looking to make a profit. So um, let's, yes, you know, we want to get, and, and they're under tremendous pressure to get something done, right? Okay, they're going to they're gonna do it. They're going to spend the money on both. But let's open their eyes to, you know, what they're going to get out of it, what the ISPs are going to get out of it. And perhaps they should assume some of the risk. 
and they can price their product appropriately. Meanwhile, you know, um, our business model is risky to begin with. And all of our capital expense needs to be grand money. That's the only way we're going to be able to afford, sustain a business for operational expenses and a capital account. So some sort of a formula that says, yes, ISPs will underwrite a third, send in your proposal. Um, the rest of the money goes to the CUDs and we, we go to everybody. We put up our towers and our fixed wireless and we get the people who aren't going to get service. And at some point in time, maybe there'll be fiber out there and maybe they'll convert over if they like the higher speeds um, or we won't need it. Anyway, so um, I just want to point out that we're talking about the immediate decision that has to be made within days, not kind of strategic decisions about how states should should allocate this stuff. This would be a good thing to talk about with, you know, with the legislature and probably the legislature when they come back in January. But um, I have uh, Jeremy and then David. Yeah, so um, I guess. I definitely get your point, Andy, that, uh, you know, we can't leave people underserved for 10 years. The the ones that I'm leaning towards or, the, or that I would be inclined to reject are on one of our proposed routes. Um, there's something like 70 some odd locate. I, I, I don't have the exact numbers. There are a lot of locations. It's a substantial portion of the orange route that just, you know, they, they're they building right over a route that we would potentially like to build in the next couple of years. If it's a place where we're not planning on building, then yeah, I can kind of see that argument where, you know, okay, we're not going to get there for a while. So if you want to build there, go for it. But if, if it's an area where, you know, we're thinking that we might want to build soon. Um, I don't know. I, I have a harder time harming the CV fiber business case. Um, and then the other thing was that um, Henry had mentioned doing a financial analysis. And I like that idea. Uh, personally, I don't have time to do that. So, I mean, if someone else wanted to take that on, great, but I don't have time to do that. So, anyway. Okay, uh, David and then Tom. Yeah, two things. One, the department this time did not send out the addresses of even the charter sites. And one of the things that I want to add to the discussion is, you know, we have our own proposal in for fixed wireless, and a good chunk of it does go to Plainfield. I have no idea whether our sites are the same sites charter is talking about without their addresses. So from that standpoint, I'm at the point not hearing on our own proposal. I'd rather say no the charter in Plainfield. We, we did oh. get those addresses just recently, David. Okay, well, I need I to check. I think I forwarded those to you. Okay, uh, but that's the kind of them. work I want to do. And, and, and you know, and, and what Jeremy said, Jeremy Hansen said earlier, I mean, this, this is a small pool of money that's going out and I'd rather you know, have it go to Card Alliance and CV Fiber than charter. So that's where I stand. Tom? So, uh, you know, I think some of our raised comments there and, and um, not being fully aware of what the details are on these various plans. Um, I'm curious as to like, you know, where do these plans from the bigger players hit on that misery scale? As far as like if the state is helping to fund the CapEx for some of that work, are they reducing their subscription fees? Are they offering some other, you know, reduced payment for those customers? That's not clear. Oh, So, so Tom, if they if they're not, I mean, we don't really know. But if they're not, if it's kind of business as usual, would you be more likely or less likely to support some of these that would overlap with, you know, in our district? I mean, I would be less likely. I mean, the, the whole mission of our work here is to help, you know, provide high level internet for a reasonable rate um, for our customers. And I think that the, the hardest hit people are the people we're trying to hit right now. Um, there's a reason they're the hardest hit, and um, I think if we're, you know, having the state or having these big players find ways to, to pay for their, 
their capex and are then going to charge the same rates well you know kudos to them but it doesn't help us all that much okay uh josh i see you posting in the chat you want to put that in words uh yeah sure i just you know uh as as someone who is you know compared to some of us on the board here and a lot of the people that we're referring to over serve in the town of Barry. I have multiple different choices of some of these, you know, I have no larger ISPs and different things. Um, I can, you know, from speaking from experience, they, uh, these bigger ISPs, they're, they, they're not going to care like we are about their, you know, about the end user. They don't care about they don't care if their service is up 100% of the time or, or even close to it. Um, and, 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 and there's, there's just no regard. Um, for, for the end user, and I've experienced that on multiple different uh, platforms. And, you know, we need to do what we can to, to get in there to help these people out. And I feel like even if in the short term, you know, someone like Charter or, or Comcast, you know, lays down and, and gets um, some of these underserved served, they'll still be wanting to, to take, um, you know, some like TV fiber up on our offering as long as it's you know competitive we priced because they'll know that we care i mean we're, we're municipally owned and operated and, and that means a lot to a lot of people i think a lot more than even some of the take rates that you know maybe you know ec fiber was was you know saying but that's just coming from someone who is on one of these bigger isps and can't wait to get off so Thanks, Josh. Um, I see a note from uh, from Henry. Uh, he says, as a newbie, I'd like to know how to get involved with the legislature and start to lobby. Um, so we only have a couple weeks and they're gonna be sprinting you know, towards the finish line and doing most of the stuff via Zoom. I did send out an email uh, earlier, uh, earlier in the meeting <clears throat> about the uh, providing testimony about the governor's budget. And also I think mentioned, I think I forwarded the one, maybe that was in the same one about the Senate finance meeting. Um, those meetings are not, unless you sign up in advance and they have time for you, those are not typically, um, not typically open to, um, kind of ra random commenters, but, uh, you could conceivably, you know, contact Ann Cummings and see if you could get on, on her agenda at some point. Um, but if we do that, we should be doing that with a common, um, with a common message, I should say. Yeah, at this point, I just want to start listening. Uh, you know, I just want to listen. Uh, you know, to the proceedings and and see how it's going down. And you know, I w yeah, I would want to coordinate before I made any testimony or anything like that. I just think it's probably pretty important, based on what everyone's saying, that we become activists with the legislature right now because it could make or break whether they're going to support the cuds or not and you know at a, at a really high level so uh that i'm just kind of trying to get involved from that point of view all right um i see a message from lee um yeah i, I should lee i should just put you on the on the board um on the board distribution list i i was ccing you and i um thanks chuck it, you're taking care of it yeah if you can just add lee to the uh the CV fiber um, board listserv, that would be great. Some of these messages uh, we get from from Rob Fish. Um, he sends out a lot of emails in a, in a given week. Sometimes it's like Senate Finance is meeting this time. This you know this committee is meeting this time. Um, and so, some of it sent to all of the CUDs. Some of it sent to us. Some of it's you know updates on uh, timing of stuff. But um, yeah, I will. I, I will try to send more of those to the board if we can. Um, anybody want the the last the last word on this? I think um, I think Jeremy and the rest of the folks on the review committee have a pretty good sense of um, where to go from here. I don't know that we need to make a formal motion or anything, but I'd like to move on if we can. I guess I'm not sure that I really do. I'm hearing kind of. 50-50 either oh. way doesn't really give us a whole heck of a lot of direction. So. You guys are doing a great job. <laughs> That's my <laughs> opinion. Because <laughs> it's a tough question. You're balancing it. 
Yeah. And you saw the input, you know, I don't know. Yeah. You're doing yeah. a good job. It's a tough, it's a tough choice. So, so yeah, and I, I think I'll actually, I'll echo what Andy was saying. I mean, that, that body was appointed to make these decisions and it's not like we were given, you know, concrete, specific, you know, specific you know, metrics or anything like that. But I think everybody's, almost everybody's had a chance to weigh in and talk about what, you know, what we should or shouldn't do and thoughts. And I think, you know, ultimately it's up to the folks on the committee to, to make that decision. I like the, I like in particular well, working group, not committee, right? Pardon? No, it's not a formal committee, correct? No, 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 no. That was, yeah. I think you, you were, you're spearheading the response as I recall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, just in, so in terms of kind of compiling that input and I think explicitly mentioning, which projects are likely to cost more for us in the future? I think having that as a little, a uh, little parenthetical is probably worthwhile. Okay. Okay. So let's, um, yeah, let's move on. Uh, appointment of an executive director. Um, so the um, most of this is going to have to be done in executive session. So I'm going to move that we enter executive session pursuant to 1 VSA section 313 sub 3 to discuss the appointment or employment or evaluation of our incoming project manager. Second. Second. Okay. So I think Siobhan was first on that. Any, um, any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Anybody want to do a roll call? Okay. So um, the ayes have it. We are now in executive session. Um, I will ask, let's see, Orca kindly if they would uh, disconnect. If not, I will, I'll give them a minute or two and have them disconnect. And can we invite Lee into this discussion? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's let's make sure we have Lee and all of the alternates here as well. Uh -huh. 